Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shooting the Shit Uncensored. I am your host, Piers Austin, and this week I'll be interviewing Al Snow. Uh, everyone knows who Al Snow is. He's had a very storied career. He's uh, mainly known for, for wrestling in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Extreme Championship Wrestling, and the WWF, where he's a former WWF, WWE hardcore champion, and also a former WWF slash WWE tag team champion with Mick Foley. But before I bring out Al, I just wanted to make a special mention and thanks I'd like to thank WCW Nation, Generational Wrestling Society, and Wrestling Maniacs for allowing us to stream uh, this interview in their groups and are making our um, audience uh, this much bigger. So thank you for that. Also, I'd like to make special mention to our sponsors, Signal Studios, who is a recording studio based out in Sydney, Australia here, and also do a lot of editing and mastering of music. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Mayan Belts, our other sp sponsor. They make great custom and replica championship belts, and they are the best in the world at what they do. Also, A-Rock Designs, run by my good friend, Ashley Rodriguez. They make great um, custom cups, hoodies, shirts, tumblers, whatever it is, uh, Christy can do it, and she does great wrestling-related cups, as well as some other related. I've got three on the way coming from her. But also, uh, one last uh, mention is Immortal Restoning by Jeff Parthay. So if you've got a belt, an older belt that you want to get redone, revamped up, contact Jeff Parthay and he'll be able to uh, definitely make your uh, belt uh, look a hell of a lot better. But before I um, – anything else, guys, I'm going to bring out Al. Al, thank you very much for joining us here today. How are you going? I'm doing just fine, and thank you very much. I hope everybody over in Australia is uh, – staying safe and staying healthy with this situation that we're all dealing with around the world. <clears throat> yeah, no, it's, uh, we're, we're definitely doing our best, uh, at this moment. And, um, you know, it's a crazy time. It's a crazy time and it's an unpredictable time as well. So, uh, how are you doing at the moment Al, over where you are? Are you safe at the moment? Healthy? Oh, we're doing great, doing great. Um, and, uh, staying healthy and, you know, doing our part to try to stay basically social distancing and, and uh, being responsible and, uh, you know, trying to protect ourselves and trying to protect everyone else at the same time. Yeah, hundred percent. And um, so Al, you've been you know, in the professional wrestling business for many years. I don't want to, to aid you here, but uh, you know, as I mentioned in the intro, you've wrestled uh, for, you know, obviously most notably Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Extreme Championship Wrestling and the WWE. Um, and also you've held many backstage roles and you're also now the current owner of Ohio Valley Wrestling. Uh, you know, anyone who doesn't know Ohio Valley Wrestling, it's pretty much been a breeding ground of WWE superstars and TNA superstars and, and obviously superstars in the world of professional wrestling for many, many years. But, um, you know, I, I don't want to sort of jump ahead, but I'd like to sort of know, how did you get involved with OVW um, at, to the point where now that you, you took ownership of that? So how did you get involved to begin with with them? Well, to begin with, I was uh, relocated down to Louisville, Kentucky when I was still with WWE <clears throat> to be the, the head trainer uh, for their developmental program with OVW. And then um, that kind of developed into uh, um, writing the TV and producing the TV and directing it uh, for OVW. Um, and then, um, you know, our relationship came to an end. Um, with WWE, they went to Florida, um, and, uh, my run with them was over. Uh, I eventually, uh, got with impact wrestling, um, and became an executive. I was the senior, senior executive director of television and, uh, talent relations, um, for a couple of years. And, uh, during that time I created a. Uh, myself with Bruce Pritchard created a developmental program for Impact Wrestling, that association with OVW again. <clears throat> I returned at that time and started um, training uh, the talent and writing um, and producing the TV again. And uh, and then that, of course, came to an end. Um, um, and then uh, at a point, finally, my relationship with Impact Wrestling came to an end. Um and then uh, how we came to own it, uh, I met my one of my business partners. Uh, he was at the time, he was an executive director of the Kentucky Boxing and Wrestling Commission. 
Um, I had went to a executive meeting of the uh, Kentucky Bu- Kentucky Boxing Wrestling Commission, um, basically asking for them to set standards uh, in requirements that in regards to training of professional wrestlers. Um, I was appalled by uh, a lot of the independent wrestlers that I was seeing out there, uh, their physical conditioning. Um, and, and I don't mean this just from an aesthetic standpoint. Um, you know, it is very much a cosmetic business. Uh, and, uh, but it, it's also, you know, a matter of, of actually being athletically conditioned so that you are safe with yourself and with the other person. Because uh, contrary to popular belief, everything that happens in that ring is quite real. The only thing that is fake is the intent behind what is done. Um, You're not in the ring to try to beat the other person or gain or maintain an advantage. You're there to portray that. And you, but you're still physically putting each other at an enormous amount of risk because every time you enter that ring, their odds are that at some point you may suffer a life altering injury or, or potentially die. Um, and that was what motivated me was, uh, uh, at that time, um, when this, uh, I've approached the KBBWC, uh, several months prior, a young man in Oklahoma had, uh, had died on an independent show, was poorly trained, uh, with another person that was poorly trained, um, performed a very simple, you know, move the spine buster, hit the back of his head with such force that it caused, you know, edema, brain swelling. He was in a coma for about five or six days and they finally had to pull the plug and it just appalled me. Um, You know, and my, my beautiful wife is a, uh, here in the United States is a reg is a licensed uh, massage therapist. And in the United States, if you want to be a beautician, you want to be a barber, you want to be a mortician, you want to be, uh, you know, a massage therapist, you have to go to a state accredited school, you have to complete, you know, you have to be taught by a state accredited teacher, you have to complete a certain number of hours of, of education, and then you have to serve a certain amount of internship, um, you know, supervised experience before you can get a license to practice your vocation. And I thought it was insulting and appalling that in professional wrestling in the United States where there are, you know, there are numerous uh, commissions, athletic commissions that govern it um, and, you know, which varies state to state, there are no standards. You can just pay your money, take a physical and you've got a license and ta-da, you're a a wrestler. And the same goes to teach or to instruct. Um, But that was how I met my partner, Chad Miller. <clears throat> and it all kind of, I, this was never my intention. It was never my goal. Um, it just kind of. I think Al's just frozen there for a second. Yeah. Uh, oh, there he is. Oh, and Danny Davis, who was the owner and founder of OVW, uh, he wanted to retire. And, um, and that was how things all kind of fell into place and ended up becoming the owner of uh, OVW. That's an amazing path of the, the, how you've gotten there as well, considering you've done many stints, that you did many stints down there in OVW, and, and you definitely would have seen a, an array of talent coming through those doors over the years. Um, I just do want to mention that we are taking questions from uh, the viewers tonight. So if you'd like to see your name come up on screen like this, uh, just make sure you click the StreamYard link above, which will allow Facebook to grant you access. So uh, my good friend, Kevin Rodriguez, who does a very similar show to this, Al, uh, says, uh, hello, Al, thank you for supporting such a great show. So I, uh, hey, Kevin. Definitely, I definitely say thank you again to that. So um, also, so Al, you know, you know, obviously being where you are now as a trainer and a developer and obviously running your own promotion, I've seen many interviews with you, Al, and, and obviously I've been a big fan for years and you've always come across to me as a very intelligent guy, not just in the wrestling business, but also in life. You know, you, you have a, you seem to be a very intelligent um, individual. And I think that being in the, the part of being able to, 
develop and train these guys and train wrestlers properly. I mean, you, you, you made mention that the independents have got to, and it's probably been that, this way for a long time where there's a lot of guys that aren't being trained properly. They don't have the physical conditioning to be in the professional wrestling business. And, you know, pro wrestling is a predetermined thing. No one's ever going to deny that. But, you know, taking a bump is real. Falling down is real. Getting hit is real. And your body needs to be physically conditioned to be able to handle that. Would you agree? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it is an athletic endeavor. <clears throat> you know, we we talked briefly about the cosmetic side of the wrestling business. And, you know, uh, you don't have to look like a bodybuilder, but you have to look like you make your living in a competitive, combative s situation. You know, it, I, I tell guys all the time, you know, because at the end of the day, your job is not to wrestle. Your job is to make yourself an attraction. Your job is to motivate people to buy a ticket to want to watch you perform mm. and you know uh i sit in independent locker rooms all the time and i'm like look around this locker room if this was a ufc fight or if this were a boxing card would you pay to see any of these guys fight and the answer no. usually is no so why is it different for wrestling i always ask that question why is it different why is it acceptable that you can go in there and and again it's not a, it's the cosmetic and the aesthetic is absolutely absolutely essential but it's also the safety issue and the professionalism and the respect for yourself and your opponent to be able to go in there and perform safely um you know and and that that takes and i've whenever young guys come up and they ask me well do you have any advice and i always tell them number one I try very carefully not to give advice. And the reason I do is because if you're smart enough, I don't need to tell you. And if you're dumb enough, you're not going to listen no matter what I say. Okay. <laughs> That's a fact. Yeah. But my advice to anyone who's listening who really wants to pursue this is number one, I don't care what you pursue in life, pursue it and it be the thing that you're passionate about pursuing. If you're not, especially professional wrestling, especially professional wrestling, if you're not passionate about this, don't bother. Don't waste, don't waste your time and please don't waste all of ours in the wrestling business. Unfortunately, you do not exist in a bubble in the wrestling business. And, and even more unfortunately, shit rolls uphill in the wrestling <laughs> business. Okay. Number two, invest time, money, and effort in yourself. Make yourself worthy of that promoter's investment of time, money, and effort in you. And especially, this is the most important thing, make sure that you're worthy of the audience's investment of their time, money, and effort in paying to see you. Because nothing is more insulting, nothing is more disgraceful than for people to actually take their hard-earned money to pay and sit in an audience and watch you go out there and they cannot in any way suspend their disbelief and be even for a fraction entertained for that time period. And that's unconscionable. Yeah, and I, 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 I agree. I agree. I mean, if you're going to get into being uh, in the professional wrestling business, you need to respect it. And one of the things is is physical fitness is part of that. And as you said, it is a cosmetic business. And you look at over the years of, of obviously, you know, the you know, looking back at the '80s as a prime example. I, I was born in the '80s, so for me, growing up in the '80s and '90s, they were always known. Wrestling was always known for body guys or you know, big jacked up guys. Guys. Um, you know, obviously you chuck in a few different types of guys like a Bam Bam Bigelow, but mind you, you look at Bam Bam Bigelow, he looked like an intimid intimidating guy. He didn't have like a six pack abs, but he looked like he could get in there and, you know, destroy someone, but he was able to do a lot of stuff. And, you know, while he did look that way, he did have a unique look to him, which made him perfect for the professional wrestling business. If that makes sense. Absolutely. It's the airport test. You know, we always say if, if, if you walk through the airport, because you have to understand, people do not want to. You, you do not want to pay to see somebody you can see for free, okay? 
you want to pay to see people that are larger than life in some manner, in some way, and whether it's their personality, their character, their charisma, their physical attributes, you want to see somebody that you can't just see walking down the street every day. And, you know, uh, to that point, uh, you know, I, I t- if you want something bad enough, okay, and this is a it, it, this applies to everything in life. If you want something bad enough, you will find a way. If you don't want it bad enough, you will find an excuse. So all of you that are out there listening and you're telling yourselves, oh, yeah, he doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. Problem is I do. I've been you to some degree, but I made a conscious decision to invest in myself. That's why I have been able to do this for a living for 38 years. You've, you, because you've, you've hung in there, you've pushed yourself and even looking at, at, at your arms now, Al, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to give your age away, but for a man who, who's, you know, in his fifties, you are looking like you were in your thirties. Like those arms are huge, man. I, I feel like I should put some sleeves on, man. <laughs> Uh, and I, I apologize. I apologize. I didn't, wasn't thinking. I had, I got done working out, and then uh, no, no, don't, then don't, I, apolo- don't apologize so, at all. Al. This is called yeah. shooting the shit uncensored, man. So yeah. it's uh, th- th- there's nothing to worry about. But we do have a question uh, from Kevin Rodriguez. Al, you you were a true in ring workhorse, uh, and you always worked with such intensity. Was it ever hard to maintain that level, or did it always come naturally? By the way, huge fan. Well, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you being a fan. <laughs> if it wasn't for guys like you, I wouldn't be able to do this for a living. So, um, yeah, it was never hard for me. It's never a challenge. It's never been a struggle. You know, I, I um, and, and, and please understand, I'm not, you know, judging anybody or or uh, sure. throwing any aspirate, you know, uh, disparagement on anyone. But I, I watch people all the time. Uh, go on Facebook or other social media platforms and they're like, oh, I'm back at the grind. You know, I'm putting in the work. I'm, I got to tell you, for 38 years, I've been on vacation. I've never once put, I've never ground shit. I've never put the work in on nothing. Now, that being said, I've never been given one single thing. Not once ever in my entire life have I been given anything. I've earned everything I've gotten, but it was never with part of professional wrestling was never a grind. It was never work. It was never, you know, uh, putting it in, whatever you want to call it, hustling. It was, I was, I just loved doing what I did. And, and when I got in the ring, it didn't, it honestly, for me, it's more of a challenge to go into a well-lit building in front of the, you know, think of a number of people that are a small amount, 150 60 people, 200, it's harder to go into that situation and to be able to elicit a very evocative, strong emotional response. And by telling a physical story through a competitive situation, it's more difficult because people are more self-conscious than it is when I would walk out in front of 60 or 70,000 people in a semi-dark arena that we're already primed. It's, you know, we call that the psychology of anonymity. The more anonymous you can make an audience, the more easily you can manipulate their emotions and the reactions. So for me, it was always a challenge to work as hard as I could to elicit as much as I could out of every single audience I was in front of. And and the, the fewer with the brighter the light, the more of a challenge it was for me to see if I could make it happen. Uh, you know what? Like, I, I could only imagine going out, and you said, like, in front of a, a dark crowd of 60,000, 70,000 people, you know, going out, and even obviously you were doing it, you know, week to week, you know, or daily pretty much. And, you know, it must sort of like the moments before you going out there, I can only imagine the feeling and the butterflies. Was that always a constant for you? Like, the butterflies just before going out, the excitement, the, the shaky legs. What was going through your mind each time you went? before you went out that curtain was it nerves well even when even if i walk up to a curtain and there's 20 or 40 or 60 or 100 or 200 people out there um i always feel like i have to go to the bathroom right before i go out like i gotta go take a piss (laughs) and um and to be quite honest if the day ever were to come 
that I would not feel like that to some degree, uh, I know that it was time to completely just quit and walk away from the wrestling business. Um, you know, it, it didn't matter if it was 70 or 70,000 people. Um, it, it just the difference between the two, and this is a this is something I try to explain to all of the students and everything, and not to dissuade anybody, but to help to enlighten uh, everyone to know because you you've got to be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. I mean, look at us right now. Um, weeks prior to this, everybody was on social media going, "God, I wish I could just sit at home and watch TV." And I hate people. I don't want to be around anybody. And ta-da! Guess what you got. Yeah, you got exactly what you wished for, and now all of you are doing is bitching and complaining about the fact that you got exactly what you wanted. So yeah. you, you know, um, but with WWE, the one thing that people don't understand about wrestling is that you serve one of only two purposes in wrestling: you are either the thing that is selling tickets, or you're one of the things that help sell tickets. There is no third option. Simple as that. Your job is to motivate people to watch that TV, not turn that channel, buy a ticket when you come to your area and drive out of their house, sit in a shitty seat around people they don't want to sit around to watch you do your job. And if you can't deliver, because the thing that people don't understand is that your name comes up every single week with Vince McMahon and it goes around the table. And if it doesn't make it around the table, you're gone. So basically, every time you perform, you're only as good as the last time you performed. And the further you go up, the more you have to lose. So you've got to go out there, especially on TV and pay-per-views, and you've got to hit a home run. Uh, you've got to hit a, go, a game-winning goal in rugby or in soccer. Yeah. You've got to deliver every single time. If you start missing, you start whiffing, you start... You know, they're going to start asking questions when that name comes around the table this week. And if the name doesn't, you keep doing it, that name ain't going to make it around the table. And no matter how much you've done, no matter how good you've been, you're going to go away. Yeah, and it's it's the same with any like any sport really. And you mentioned football, soccer. You know, it's the same thing. If you can't perform consistently, consistently at a level where you can be relied upon, um, and especially in WWE being the largest you know platform of professional wrestling in the world, um, you know, if you can't deliver on that platform, then you know you're going to find yourself being lower and lower down on that totem pole. Um, you know, you're, not gonna, you're gonna find yourself not there. That's what's gonna happen because any other sport is a team sport. Mm -hmm. Okay. The audience pays to see the team. In professional wrestling, they're paying to see you. Yeah. And that's the main main thing. But uh, we, we're going into another couple of questions here, Al. Uh, we've got Jeff Girati. Sorry if I pronounced that name incorrect. Um, he wants to know who were your favorite wrestlers growing up? Who were your inspirations? Well, Thanks for the question, Jeff. Probably guys you probably have never heard of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, Bobo Brazil and Flying Fred Curry. Uh, I was a big fan of Bull Curry. I, I grew up in the Midwest, and I grew up in the Sheik, uh, Ed Farhat's territory. Uh, Al Costello and Don Ken. I think Al's just frozen there on us a little bit. Yeah, uh, there he is. Started wrestling in 1939. Was a noted hooker, too. Um, not a prostitute. Uh, <laughs> that's a, it's that's an a old wrestling, school wrestling term. term, yeah. Yeah, so I got to spend a lot of time with Al. I became, I, I became a, you know, one of the incarnations of uh, the Fabulous Kangaroos, which was a big honor for me. Um, and, uh, you know, I got to learn with Al and learn to, to you know, catch wrestling and learn to hook and uh, it was a blast. It was really a big thrill for me to do that. But, uh, you know, and then when I was growing up in my teen years, uh, you know, Dusty Rhodes wrestling to Austin Idol, you know, uh, Buzz Sawyer, um, you know, um, just just incredible guys that, you know, you'd watch. And then uh, Jerry Lawler, the older I get, the more of a fan I become of Jerry Lawler and the more yeah. I appreciate just how brilliant he is. Ricky Morton, same thing. Um, just, just incredible. Uh, his talent, his ability. 
Um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Ricky Morton. I've been loving his work with on the NWA. Uh, you know, seeing the Rock and Roll Express, you know, really sort of being back in the forefront in a major promotion, it, it brings a smile to my face. Yeah, yeah. They, I got to do a run with them in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and you know, it was it was so incredible. You know, the you know, it was so much. So it was every night was a day off, night off. Just it was so fun, so much fun. You mentioned Smoky Mountain Wrestling, and for those of you who don't know, you had a, were in a tag team with Glenn Jacobs, who was known as the Uni Bomber um, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling. And you and the Uni, well, Glenn or Kane, whatever you want to call him, you guys actually beat the Rock and Roll Express for the Smoky Mountain Tag Titles. Yeah, you know, and I and now when I look back, and I know now what I knew I didn't know then. Like we had a good run. But we could have gotten so much more heat. We could have taken so much more advantage of the opportunity um, if I had done what I should have done, which was I was supposed to be the the uh, smart ass uh, chicken shit guy who started the fight and then let Glenn come in and put a stop to it. And you know, um, you know, I was too busy just going right in there in the ring and you know killing my own heat by letting letting the baby faces get their hands on me when I should have. Because I was too concerned at the time about having a great match and have you know make, getting my stuff in, and as opposed to doing great business, we did good business, but we could have done so much more if I had uh, really you know smartened myself up ahead of time, or if somebody you know if Cornette had even pulled me aside and go, look, you you're spending too much time in the ring, you need to run your mouth on the promos and then make people want to see you get your ass kicked and then try to prevent it from happening as much as possible and then tease it as much as you can as well. So. Yeah. But I think that's just obviously the, the learning process. I mean, back then, you know, you, you, you were learning the business of professional wrestling and, and that's the, that's the thing now where you can look back and go, okay, well, you learn from that experience to obviously, you know, years down the track, if you're in that similar sort of situation, you would know how to operate, um, you know, more effectively. Yeah. I, I, you know, I was taught initially, you know, all of that. And then I got in the wrestling bubble, like so many do. And, um, you know, I lost sight of doing business and, just wanted to have a great match and not a match that did great business per se. And, uh, that was a mistake, you know, I, and I try to impart that upon the people that I teach and train, uh, now. So, so Andrew Baker, he has a question. He's one of the admin at multi-continental wrestling Alliance who runs the page with me. He says, hi, Al. Firstly, thank you for coming and giving us your time. I met you in Adelaide, Australia, when you came and joined Mick Foley's tour. Second, I saw a clip on YouTube of you discussing tag team wrestling and Dewey, the mentality <laughs> handicap wrestler. Do you think tag teams have improved? And could you tell the story of watching Dewey's tag match? <laughs> sure. If you want me to, it's a rather long story, but. Go for uh, it, no. Uh, do I think the tag teams have improved? God, no. I think they're god awful now. I think that, you know. Um, I think that they're they're the reason that tag teams have kind of fallen to the wayside is because, um, quite honestly, they're the they're the shits, um, you know, uh, and well, let me explain why, and that is because first and foremost, besides, yeah, you know, we won't even get into that stupid seven step formula that everybody's being taught these days. It's just asinine. Um, on many different reasons and i could spend a whole show on explaining why that doesn't work it never has it never will um you know it's not a matter of opinion and and please understand that anything that i say i can back up with an explanation a logical fact-based explanation okay it's not like i'm just going to make a statement and oh well you know it's just because you know old school this there is no old or new school you've not reinvented the wheel it's not octagonal or hexagonal i swear to you the only thing that has changed about professional wrestling is the level of sophistication of an audience that's it here in the united states they have known the fan base here in the united states have known that professional wrestling was fixed or a work since the 1920s that wasn't it's not like they just came upon that they just figured it out okay so the one thing that you always have to do 
as a professional wrestler is you have to sell the objective. That's preeminently, that's the first thing you and always do. That's kayfabe, is you always sell who you are and why you're doing it. The only fans are butts because that's all that an audience pays to believe in are those two things, who you are and why you're doing it, okay? Uh, the second thing that you have to do, no matter what type of match you're working, and there's, a, there's the term working, okay? And we misuse that term these days because we, oh, you know, that guy over there, yeah, he's really good. He's a great worker. No, he's not. He's a great performer. He's a great athlete. He's not a worker. A worker is a guy who goes out and makes you believe a lie. That's a work is a con. It's a sham. It's to make you believe something that's not real. And the only thing that's not real about professional wrestling is that the outcome is predetermined. The lie is that it's not and that that win or loss have a consequence. Okay. So the, uh, you sell the objective all the time so that you can work the gimmick of the match. Now, what's the gimmick? And all these terms are from Carney days, and I can explain all this and go into great detail, but I, you know, it take that's a whole nother topic. The, the working the gimmick means this. How do you win? Okay. If it's a normal singles match, the two preeminent ways of winning that wrestling match are pinfall or submission. If you were actually selling the objective properly then psychology is pretty easy. You're simply going to make it look like you're trying to gain and maintain control of your opponent to try to pin him or eventually wear down a body part and make him give up. Thus, by working the gimmick, you tell a story that allows drama because it creates a consequence to your actions, which then create heat. Heat's not a spot in the match or offense. It's a want, it's a need, it's a desire. Think of it when you were a kid and your brother or sister or your friend would play a game of keep away where they teased you with something and just as you reached it and almost got it, they took it away from you. That's heat. It's not the heels offense, you nimrods. So why is tag team wrestling so bad today? Here's why. The gimmick, the easiest gimmick in wrestling is a tag team match because it's obvious, it's visual that to win the match, you work as a team by tagging in and out as much as you possibly can to eventually wear your opponent down, keeping the ring cut in half. But that doesn't happen anymore. And let's be honest, you all know that it doesn't. It's either you watch two singles matches or you watch two separate tag matches. And then you, for some reason, think that it's okay to one, completely ignore the official, because the only reason the official's there, the only reason you have rules are to give you a structure, a foundation that now says one of these guys or two of these guys on the other team or in the singles match are doing something wrong to gain an upper hand. And they're doing it without being caught, which now drives the heat. It's unfair. It's not right. It's unjust. That's heat. Okay? A tag match... Let's be honest, if it were real, and I always use this, not a shoot, let's say you're actually going to shoot people in the ropes, you know, it, it quite honestly is very simple, similar to UFC, but of course, we're never going to see uh, tag matches in UFC. No. Um, but if we did, what would happen would be the two fighters would try to cut that octagon in half and keep their one opponent in that side of the octagon as much as possible by tagging in and out as frequently as possible. By doing this, you've told the audience that the more that the other the team tags in and out, the more jeopardy that the their opponent is in and the closer he may come to losing. The more he desperately tries to reach across the ring and make that tag and just as he's about to get it, the other team pulls him away. That creates heat. It creates that want, that need, that desire to see him finally tag and hopefully his partner will be able to turn things around. That's why it's called a hot tag because the heat is on the tag by working that gimmick of the match. You've built that heat, that want, that need. And why it's so easy is because it's a visual thing. By bringing it so close, but they're not getting it. And then when it finally gets there, bang. And that's when the crowd start, loses their shit. The heater comes in. And we could get even into finish 
coaching move, you know, you know, that's established. All that is is just to simply give you a gimmick to be able to tell a story throughout the mess heat. That's why historically most heels always had submission finishes and most baby faces had bump finishes. Bump finishes is that they could anytime, no matter the sign, back to selling. And the heel could put that hold on, that submission that he had beaten 100 people prior with. And now there was no way that you could put more baby face and more jeopardy of losing. No yeah. more way that you could get the baby face more over from underneath that so you know that you know i tell the story of dewey brown and dewey was an awesome guy um dewey was you know special uh and and again you know i i, I you know encourage everyone but you know sometimes you've you, there are limits you know and uh I watched this match. Uh, we won't go into the whole the details, but uh, this was a prime example of working the gimmick and thus telling a story that uh, you know um, got Dewey over. And what I mean by over is the real term over, which means is to make the audience want to live vicariously through you. Think when you were just a wrestling fan before you became what you claimed to be smartened up about it. When you were just a wrestling fan, think of your favorite wrestler, and you don't need to say who it is because it's never me, so I'm pretty used to that by now. Um, I was just going to say Al Snow. Nah, I was just yeah. going to say that. Come on. <laughs> but the first one that comes in, the really comes in your head, the one guy that you really liked, okay? Now, remember how much you used to want to be like that guy when you imagined you'd wrestle, you wrestle, you would do moves like him. You were one of the way you thought about gear. You were going to have gear similar to his. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. You 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 envisioned yourself doing a lot of the same things. And you used his catchphrases. You bought his merch. That is over. That's what that is. And it's the most important thing in wrestling because without getting the baby face over, we can't get any heat. If people don't care about the 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 person the 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 baby face the heel can't do anything to him i always use this analogy if we walk outside right now into your parking lot or on your street uh or your driveway or whatever you call it car park can we see somebody standing on it all over our, it's not your car and they're setting that car on fire let's be honest you're probably at most going to call emergency services to come out and put a stop to it, call the police. Okay. You're not going to get involved because it's not your car and you don't care. More likely you're going to pull your phone out, start videotaping it and scream world star hip hop. So yeah. if we walk outside though, and we see somebody with a can of gas, pouring it all over your car and setting your car on fire, uh, you're probably going to react a little differently. You're probably going to run over and try and stop them. And the reason why yeah. is because it's your car. You care. If we walk outside and we see somebody doing that to your car with your family and your dog in it, you're probably going to run over and try and kill them. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Think of the baby face in wrestling as your car. If that baby face in that ring is not your car, it don't matter what the heel does to him as much as he does to him. You don't care. You don't get yeah. any heat. If the baby face through his own actions and through the heels actions, make that baby face, the audience's car, everybody cares. If we make him their, uh, their car with their family and their dog in it, I do one thing to that baby face. I've just done it to everybody in the building. That's over. So the reason I explain that is because and go through all of this is so that people actually understand what I'm trying to explain when I tell the story. Uh, my brother wrestled for a while and, uh, you know, did really well for himself, got married, uh, went back to college, uh, doesn't wrestle anymore, was retired, uh, you know, came to me and wanted me to come watch uh, one of his one of a match that he was going to in a show on a, one night. And I was you know, didn't feel like doing it. I was uh, just starting down in OVW, and he's trying to convince me, and he knows my uh, 
appeal for the unusual, the odd. I love it. So <laughs> he starts telling me about Dewey Brown and uh, and his partner, L.S. Criterio, and how the month prior they did like a an in-ring promo with L.S. Criterio and Dewey Brown to set up this match where the heels were the tag team champions and they were did an in-ring promo and um, – uh, one of the heels had said something that hurt Dewey's feelings, like for real, like genuinely hurt his feelings. And he lost his shit. He ran across the ring, double legged the heel and proceeded to start beating the living shit out of him Jeez. to, and go, went so nuts that the referee, the ring announcer and the, his partner, Ellis Criterio and the other heel couldn't pull him off of him. He just was <laughs> beating the hell out of him. So I was mildly intrigued. And then he tells me about L.S. Criterio's tattoo. And I'm like, I got to go see this. There's no way that this guy's got this <laughs> tattoo on him. So I'm, I'm in. So I go watch the show, right? I, I, I go with uh, my brother. I go backstage to say my, you know, be polite and, and introduce myself, shake hands. Um, mm-hmm. And then I don't, you don't stay backstage. You know, you go out and you sit in the audience and you don't sit in the first couple rows because that's the money-making rows. You find a place where you can watch and you stay out of the way and you don't take, take away from the show. Um, and you don't hang around backstage because you're, it's not your show. You're not on the card. So it's not your locker room. Yeah. So, but while I was in there, I kept trying to see El Criterio and his tattoo and I never could get a look at it because he'd either had a shirt on or, you know, he, he would be moving when he took yeah. his shirt off, he turned, I'm like, God damn it. I want to see this tattoo. <laughs> so, I watch the, I go out, I watch the show and I, I am, you know, not dogging anybody, but you know, there was maybe 50 or 60 people there. And, and, you know, you'd have thought that there were armed guards positioned at all of the ring posts and the audience was under threat of gunfire if they made a noise during the show. I mean, it was like they were going to, if they said they cheered or booed or did anything, they were going to get shot. So Brutal. this, this show is, it's painful. So, uh, I'm kind of like, Oh God, but now. Here comes the match that I've been waiting for. It's the tag team championship match. Okay. Uh, out comes, you know, the tag team champions. Uh, out come the heels. Okay. Out comes Dewey and his partner, L.S. Criterio. And I'm excited because I'm like, uh, L.S. Criterio is going to have to take off his shirt. Now, let me explain. You know, L.S. Criterio has three tattoos at that time. He had like uh, some flames down here. Then he had a big open space on his arm and he had triple oh, he had triple X's down here. And they had a big open space and up near his shoulder, he had flames. Okay. We well, thought those had been attached and then that was it. That's all he had, except for on his side right here on the entire side of his rib cage, he had the tattoo that I wanted to see, but he came out wearing a shirt, both he and Dewey wearing shirts that they had, that had, they had handmade that had arrows like, you know, the I'm with stupid shirts. <laughs> but they were pointing at each other saying superstar okay so dewey gets in the ring takes his shirt off i'm waiting i'm waiting and ls criterio <laughs> does not take his shirt off i'm like ooh, ooh. <laughs> well i'm in for a treat anyways so yeah. i start watching the match start watching the match and it's pretty obvious not too far into the match that the heels are supposed to win but apparently, um, somebody did not give that memo to Dewey because they're <laughs> trying to pin him and he is continuously kicking out uh, to the point to where the referee is now trying to count faster to <laughs> finish the match. And you're watching, I'm watching the heels get ex- ex- exasperated. Like they're literally getting frustrated and you can see them talking to each other like, what the fuck, you know, what are you doing? He just keeps getting out. Right. The more that he keeps kicking out and the more that he keeps struggling to make the tag, the more the audience starts getting behind Dewey. He's doing it so much so that the heels have to literally genuinely work as a team to prevent him from making it across the ring. He he keeps almost getting away. And as he almost gets away, the crowd starts to go (gasps) and then they take him away and they get angry. And then when the ref starts fast counting, 
the audience starts getting pissed at the referee to the point where a couple guys stood up and started threatening him <laughs> because they thought he was doing things unfairly in in the heels fat you know benefit which he was for a shoot because they were trying to beat Dewey because that was yeah. what the, was supposed to happen but Dewey again, to go apparently yeah. Dewey apparently didn't get the mellow but the more <laughs> he did it and the more he tried to make the tag and the more they had to struggle and cheat to keep him in the corner the more the crowds got behind Dewey and started chanting for him I'm like this is amazing it's incredible <laughs> And, right. it, and, it was, and it was simple, but it was actually like almost a shoot <laughs> happening in the ring. And then yeah, well, he, pay attention. Like, he's actually That's got what's, how many times have you seen that happen in these days? None. So finally, they decide, let's make a change of plans. We can't get Dewey to cooperate. Let's bring in L.S. Criterio. We'll just, you know, pin him, right? Seems solid. They, of course, do a little spot. Dewey gets away, makes the tag. The place comes alive. Literally, it's a genuine hot tag. Alice Criterio comes in and starts pulling a little bit of a comeback. They put the brakes on him. Okay. They cover him. You know, crowd's like, no. One, two, what happens? He Dewey runs out. in and breaks up. He, uh -uh. <laughs> no. Dewey runs in and breaks up the pin. <laughs> ah, damn, Dewey. <laughs> the heels again are like, what? what is he doing? Like, and every time they put, Ellis Criterio in a compromising position, Dewey comes in and breaks it up over and over again to where now the fans are getting more behind Dewey. And he's on the ring apron pacing like a tiger. He's put his hand out there begging for Ellis Criterio to make the tag. I mean, it's, and the crowd is just getting more amped up, wanting Dewey back in the ring. Okay. Dewey's, Dewey's either the greatest wrestler of all time. Or he's the most frustrating, annoying Mark of all time. You know what I mean? So I, I'm not sure. After he's, the greatest, he's, he's the greatest worker. He yeah. has that audience right in the palm of his hands. And they, he is getting over like a million bucks. So now they, of course, you can see them fall back. The heels reevaluate the plan. You can watch all this happening. And they're like, well, let's get Dewey back in here. Because if we don't get him back in here, he's just going to keep breaking up the pin. Right? Maybe we yeah. can control him. So now El Scriterio, another spot, rolls out, tags Dewey, the place comes up even higher. Just boom. I mean, they people are on the feet. Dewey comes in like a house fire. I don't remember exactly how it happened, but there was a little bit of a four-way. El Scriterio and heel number two disappear. They take a bump on the floor and they just disappear. Heel number one, double legs Dewey and takes him down and puts him in a shoot figure four leg lock he's trying to get him to give up okay and dewey is screaming bloody murder because he's for you know he's hurting him yeah. he's trying to get him to quit and and dewey won't give up and the crowd is now getting more behind dewey the more he's fighting and he's he's crying he's literally he's crying his face is purple he's crying and he won't he won't quit he won't give up you know, he's trying to reach the ropes. The audience is now building even more. The heat is building. They're dying for him to reach the rope. I don't know how he did it, you know, because on a canvas, it's supposed to be stretched like a drum, you know, skin, real tight so that you don't trip on it or, you know, pull up or anything. He grabbed handfuls of that canvas. I mean, dug his fingers in and just pulled himself and his opponent across the ring reaching out and the audience is like begging for him and he grabs the rope right and the ref starts counting the heel and the heel's like don't let him go because now remember what happened the last month when all it, all it was hurt was his feelings okay yeah. Yeah. he went batshit crazy so the heel knows if dewey gets out of this shit's on you know what yeah. i mean it's not gonna be good so he's sitting there, you know, the ref's telling him, let him go, let him go. And he's screaming, no, no, right? And so a couple guys stand up in the audience again, like they're about to hit the ring. And the yeah. ref sees them and is like telling the heel, you got to stop, you man, you got to let him go. You got to let him go. They're, come, they're going to come in the ring. You can see all this being said. And the heel's freaking out. He doesn't know what to do. And Dewey's still screaming bloody murder, hanging on the rope. And a couple more guys stand up, right? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to watch a riot. This is going to be amazing. I, I, 
I'm so thrilled that this might possibly happen. <laughs> so uh, you see all of a sudden the heel goes, okay, and, he, and the ref's helping him get his legs undone. Dewey, as soon as he gets out of the figure four, is pulling himself on the ro- up the ropes. The heel's getting up, and Dewey launches himself and lets out the the most insane blood curdling scream, <laughs> like a battle cry, and dives at the heel. The heel grabs Dewey, and pulls him tight to him, falls backward, takes a bump, holds on to him as Dewey's struggling to try to beat the shit out of him. Yeah. He's holding him to him as tight as he can and starts screaming at the referee, count, 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 right? Crowd is going crazy. The ref goes down, counts one, stops, shakes his hand, doesn't know what to, counts two. He goes up again like he's, and he's holding it and, you know, Dewey's still trying to beat the hell out of the guy and the guy's still screaming count. A bunch of guys, a bunch of people in the audience stood up. They were going to hit the ring and beat the referee up. You could tell if he didn't count. He finally just goes and shrugs his shoulders and goes, three, the place explodes, just explodes. A real what you call pop. They popped their nut because Dewey won. He went over and that place (laughs) went crazy. Okay. The keel immediately rolls out. He grabs his partner. El Escritario stands on the opposite, stands up on the opposite side of the ring on the floor, like, "Oh, we 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 won! Oh, oh, great!" <laughs> like he was confused. Oh. Dewey's limping in the ring, crying, being handed the belt. People are crying in the audience. They're they're cheering him as he and El Escritario get out of the ring. They're coming up, slapping him on the back, shaking his hands. I mean, it was a Al's just frozen. That audience, the they were Sorry. able to work that. Dewey was able to work that audience and get them so emotionally invested that they took physical action. It was it was incredible. So then, of course, I immediately run to the back because you know the the match was awesome, but I didn't care about that. I wanted to see El Escritario's tattoo. That's all I cared about. <laughs> So I'm back in the back, you know, Dewey's back here crying, face all, you know, the promoter's confused. He don't know what to do. The heels are upset. You know, El Scriterio now takes his shirt off. Here's my chance. Here's my moment. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm like, and I slide right up to him, you know, forget the match. I didn't care about that. I wanted to know, I wanted to see this tattoo. So I start a conversation with him and I'm like, wow, El Scriterio, that's pretty cool, man. You know, because most luchadors have some kind of exciting, dangerous name, like, you know, Aero Fuego, which means Skyfire in English, or, you know, or Blue Demon, or Mil Mascaris, or Al Santo. I'm like, El Escriterio, that's that's cool. Um, what's that mean in Spanish? And he goes, and this is <laughs> salt, too, I can't make it up. He goes, it means the desk. I go, I'm sorry? Wait, what? <laughs> he goes, it means the desk. I go, you're named after a large, heavy piece of furniture? He goes, well, it sounds cool. I'm like, well, yeah, you got me. It does. It's awfully cool. I mean, but you're a desk. That's, you're a desk. So on his (laughs) side here, okay, probably one of the most, I I don't have any tattoos. I don't know how much, how painful they are to get, but I can imagine this would probably be not one of the favorite places to get. No, that'd be intense, yeah. He had all this other skin, but he decided to put it there. And it was, I'm telling you, from his armpit all the way to his hip. And it was all the way around the su- each side. Okay. Yeah. And it looked like an eight-year-old with a blue Sharpie drew it on. What do you think he had there? Mm, a desk? Nope. That <laughs> would be too much like right. Um, nope. He, no, I, I, he I, had a top-loading Sears Kenmore washing machine tattooed on his side. No. That I is swear nice to bro. God. I used to have a picture out of my phone. I showed Steve Austin one time and he was like, he, cause he didn't believe me and I had to show it to him. I lost the photo, but yeah, it was, it was a, it was a Sears Kenmore top loading washing machine that was on his, uh, on his side. Oh, of course I, I was like, that's amazing. Uh, why'd you get a washing machine on your side? He goes, so I thought it'd be different. You know, I didn't, you know, nobody, I didn't think anybody else would have it. And I go, oh, well, you're right. Um, I've I've been all over the world. I've seen a lot of tattoos. I've never seen anybody with a home appliance on their side. That is I'm insane. Like, that is insane. I said, you ever thought about getting a, you're going to get a dryer on the other side? He goes, no. I go, why not? He goes, I don't like them. I'm like, 
<laughs> Maybe a clothesline or something. <laughs> yeah. I just that and is- I looked over. I looked over at Dewey and I looked back at him and I'm like, I now know who the brains of the operation are here. So yeah, look, I yeah, as you can see, I've, I've got quite a few tattoos, but uh, yeah, no no uh, washing machines or dishwashers or home appliances. Another one, big fan of this guy. This guy, man, he is trippy. He it's what makes wrestling so awesome is meeting these people, the most unique. And I tell these stories, and people are like, ah, there's no way, you know, it can't be that can't be real. But it's like this is all real. I don't make any of those up. Okay, met he he also in the in that area. Uh, his name's Scary Gary. Okay, uh, Scary Gary's pretty awesome because in the middle of his forehead, right here, he has a Hello Kitty tattoo. Oh, yeah, and <laughs> has a line down his body, down his forehead, <clears throat> down his whole body because his plan was because one of his arms is blue and the other arm pink. He was going to tattoo his entire body blue on one side and pink on the other. Um, he's awesome, just oh, awesome. that sounds awesome, yeah. Uh, so Angel Medina, a friend of uh, a, a good friend of mine uh, who I've interviewed, but before you uh, may know Al, he was in ECW for a while. Uh, he yeah. was uh, the leader of the Baldies. Angel, he says, "What's up, Al?" So Angel's hey, a, hey, Angel. Angel's a good friend of mine. We actually have a uh, a show coming up that me, him, and Kevin Rodriguez are going to be filming shortly. So it's going to be another podcast type thing uh, where we're going to explore the underbelly of professional wrestling. So. I'll make sure yeah. to send you some info on that. So, yeah, I think you might be interested in it. But uh, so I, I wanted to get into your your time in in WWE, and I really wanted to sort of go into the start of it before the you know what does everybody want? But you know, you, you had uh, quite a few different characters or, or gimmicks, if you want to call them, um, before going over to ECW and WWE. Yeah, I, Quite honestly, all of that was my fault, okay? My responsibility. I want to make that perfectly clear that Vince McMahon does not make you a star, okay? Um, What Vince McMahon or any promoter does is they provide a platform and then you utilize the platform to its fullest to make yourself a star. And again, I can't emphasize enough that what it is that you're selling, okay, is who you are. Do you have to, if you, if you, the audience can believe in who you are, they'll believe in anything you do. Um, and, you know, uh, for a lot of years, uh, um, I was uh, a heel. Uh, I was known as the best kept secret in wrestling for a long time. Um, and the reason why was because I didn't have a definable personality or definable character. The reason I got an opportunity in Smoky Mountain was because I had trained Dan Severin for UFC 4 and, you know, was in his corner and the guy came up and I was trying to interview Dan after the second fight because at that time you had to do three fights. It was a tournament. Yeah. And um, Dan won the second fight. He was going to face Hoist Gracie in the in the final match. And, you know, they come over and he comes over and he's trying to ask Dan quest, you know, this leading question of, you know, uh, trying to put Hoist over. And Dan wasn't very astute at doing interviews at that time. And, you know, um, and I don't know why it just pissed me off that he was trying to put, you know, hoist over again. And I'm, he's like, you know, what are you going to do now, Dan? What are you going to do now? And I'm like, what do you think he's going to do? He's going to have sex. So I was being a smart ass <laughs> who I had known for years, you know, never had an interest in bringing me into Smoky Mountain until he watched me doing that interview. And then he, that got me the opportunity when Eddie uh, Gilbert left to take the book in Puerto Rico he needed somebody with a cane with uh, Glenn mm-hmm. and me having that personality was what gave me that opportunity. Um, you know, and then leaving there and going to WWE, um, you know, I was given the avatar gimmick, which, you know, uh, it was up to me to make it work. And, and, and I didn't, um, for, you know, numerous reasons, um, you know, and then, I was given the Leaf Cassidy gimmick, and, and, and it had its run. It had a run, but, you know, Marty didn't have his heart in it, which, you know, I can't I can't uh, emphasize enough how talented Marty Jannetty really is. And, and, and quite honestly, I think that, you know, he was 
the reason that Sean was as successful and understands as much as he does is because of learning from Marty. Um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, but Marty, you know, understandably, I mean, he, he, I think he saw it as, you know, you know, it was a knock or it wasn't, you know, it was everything that he and Sean had done, you know, Hey, there's a little one. Yeah. And, this, is my, um, this is my son Hendrix. He's just coming to say hello. Hi, Hendrix. 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 Hey, how are you, buddy? <laughs> um, say hello. Go back to mom. Good boy. And then Sorry. when, you know, I had that run with, with that and then I was floundering again and, you know, because I had, I didn't, again, did not have a definitive personality. It wasn't, you know, I went to ECW and, and I went there, I was put on loan. I tried to quit WWF at the time and, and, uh, they rolled over my contract and, you know, put me on loan there. And I went there for the sole reason I wanted to get myself over, not Paul. Paul did not get me over. I got me over I and the reason I got me. Because I wanted, I needed to get myself over so that either Vince would pay to get me back, Paul would pay to keep me, or WCW Eric would pay to take me away. That was all I cared about, and that was the sole focus. I was no longer focused on I got to have a great match, I got to do this. It was about getting over, and I developed that persona, that personality, and the reason that it worked, quite honestly, is because it was who I really was. It was, you know, all that frustration and all of that resentment and, and anger, which I, I mistakenly directed at everybody else instead of at myself, uh, you know, it was, it would, when I would communicate with the head, that was where, you know, that was real. That was all of that frustration mm-hmm. coming out. And, you know, that's why it connected with people because they, they believed it was who I really was. Mm-hmm. And, you know, um, and to be honest, like, you know, when I, when I was really over with it at the time, when I went to back to WWE, you know, I traveled by myself. I would, you know, a lot of times uh, before Mick and I would hook up and, you know, um, I would go into restaurants and it would be just me and the head and I'd, I'd get a table for two and I'd set the head across the table for me and I'd order dinner for both of us and I'd sit there and talk to them in public and, you know, it was very uncomfortable, um, very awkward. You know, a lot of times I got asked to leave restaurants and, you know, gyms and, um, but, um, if you were to ask, you know, and, uh, a hundred people, if I was genuinely insane back then, a hundred people would tell you, yeah. And, you know, um, you know, it was, it was so important, um, to do that because, you know, when I get put on TV, you know, and you're flipping through the channels, um, you know, I've got to catch your attention. And if you saw me three weeks ago with your family at a restaurant and you all of a sudden see me out on TV and you're like, Hey, here's that lunatic we saw at the restaurant. That guy's really crazy. You know, now I'll think of all the ridiculous things I did in WWE and nobody questioned it. Everyone yeah. believed it. And the reason they did was because I genuinely thought I was out of my mind, you know? Um, and you know, Again, that was, that was, that was, uh, that's the major factor in, in, in success. That's, that is the one, the key element in a wrestler's success is to be able to have a persona that fans can turn to the friends. We're just frozen. Oh. Elle's just frozen there for a second. Here he is. Oh. Um, yeah, sorry. You just froze, but that you know what the, i remember seeing you when you came back from ecw into wwf so in australia we had very limited wrestling on what we had back then and it was really the start of the internet so you didn't really be able to research much and find much as what we can now but um and i remember seeing you come in from and like they had the clips of ecw with you with the head and and like the whole crowd in ecw having their styrofoam heads and when you were coming out and just like banging the heads along to the music and you know, I was, I was 17 years old. I was captivated by, by what you were coming out. Cause I was like, this is something different. This is something that I'd never seen before in professional wrestling. And straight away I was captivated for it. And I wanted to learn more. Who is this guy with the head? Who is this Al Snow? Yeah. And I, you know, became a really big fan of yours 
by, you know, like, because I was just captivated. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to see more of you. And, you know, you were so over as a baby face as well, especially like having the hardcore title, the European title, and, you know, your run with Mick as well, that is like when you like were winning like those championships, I was really happy and excited for you because I was like, you know, I was over. I believed you got, you were this like lovable, crazy sort of person. And, you know, obviously that character and being able to live that gimmick for you, you know, to obviously invest that much time into it, it really paid off for you because that was the the, the real catalyst into, you know, the, the characters that you had previously, this one was the most believable. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, I would. It was it was just um, because it's an extension of who I really was. And, um, you know, uh, it, I, I can't emphasize enough that, you know, it's it's – People don't understand the term kayfabe anymore. They think that kayfabe's dead and nothing could be further from the truth. Um, you know, kayfabe would, besides it just being a code word, a non-descriptive word that we would use within wrestling to, you know, hey, you know, hey, did you see that girl last night? What was her name again? That was K kayfabe. And that was just, it was a signal to let let uh, the boys know that there was somebody in, in their midst that they didn't want to talk around. Um yeah. It's gotten perverted, and, and a lot of, again, people out there believe that, 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 that that's dead, which nothing could be further from the truth. It was a respect for yourself and what you were doing and a respect for your audience. Um, nothing could be worse than to sell an audience something, a product, you, and who you are, and then for them to then see that it's not true um, because now they're not going to be as motivated to pay to see it or buy it again. And, you know, everybody complains about the internet and social media. The internet and social media are amazing tools and, and they're great, especially for professional wrestlers these days. We didn't have them back in the day. We, had, we were totally reliant on whether or not a promoter would put us on TV to make us an attraction, to make our name mean something on that poster. Because quite honestly, you're not entitled to anything. You're not entitled to get paid. It, it, that, it, this is not a job. It's not like where you show up at a employment place and you put your time in and you get paid you have to earn everything you get based on how many people are motivated to buy a ticket to see you and the only way that that used to happen was if you were put on tv now you've got social media to be able to We've make yourself sound out we can't hear you can you hear me now can you hear me now can you hear me now la, 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 la. Hey, yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, yeah. we can hear you back now okay so, for instance, the Bucks, you know, the Young Bucks had made, they've made themselves into an attraction, you know, using YouTube. Um, and the, the, the problem is, though, that, and I give this advice to every young wrestler, and I give it to all the people in OVW, which none of them listen to me, because they're, you know, they all think it's, you know, it's brand new for them. But make two social media platforms, uh, your Facebook, your Instagram, Snapchat, whatever you use, make two of them. Make a public one and make a personal one. Make a personal one that's private and only your friends and family can access and be you, okay? The public one, you be the person that they see on TV. Never stop selling who you are that they've bought into, you know, a while back, everybody was like, oh, Matt Hardy, he's such a genius. He's so incredible. He never breaks character. Listen, we've been doing that for decades. That That's nothing new, mm. okay? He's just now using the platform of social media to follow through with it and convince an audience even that much more. And you can do the same thing, you know? I, I went to great lengths to do that, and that was that was what was instrumental in my success. But the, I could have been even more successful, though, if I'd have understood the opportunities I had, and then capitalized on them even more. But again, I, I got in that mindset of that wrestling bubble and wanting to have just a great match and as opposed to matches that did great business in a lot of cases. And that was where I fell short. Uh, otherwise, I'd have had even, you know, uh, I had a great career, had a wonderful yeah. career, but I could have had an even more successful one than what I did if I'd have just been focused on the right things. Yeah, and uh, look, I think as well, you know, where you've been in your career, Al, 
um, you know, can never be sold short. You you had some amazing opportunities in the professional wrestling business, and you know, I, I think everyone who's ever been in the professional wrestling business always wants to be that top guy. I think Stone Cold Steve Austin says the best: if your goal or ambition is not to be the the WWE or the the top champion in that promotion, then what the fuck are you doing in the, in the business? You know, and right. ex- excuse my French, but we are uncensored. So, um, but you know, and, and that's the thing. But taking that, nothing taking away from your career, you've definitely had a, had had a great run where every you know where that you've been. You know, especially in the ECW and WWE. You know, WWE, you got to run it back. You got to come out, do the Al Snow character, and that's really been able to sort of you know catapult that you know into to the main point of your success. Um, but, you know, I wanted to make mention, and I, I do realise we're just hit over the hour mark, and, and I don't want to keep you too much longer, Al, but I wanted to ask you about the dog kennel from hell match that you had with Big Boss Man. Now, I've heard you comment on it before in, in other interviews, but how did you find, like, I think, and, and I want to give my personal perspective on it, I think the dog kennel, the dog kennel from hell match looked great on paper. But sure once, they, sure. once I put it into play, you know, and, and I've heard you mentioned before, it, it wasn't, you know, it, what, it didn't live up to what it could have been. But what was your feeling going into that match? What was your understanding of, of the match and the elements? And, and how did you, what was your mentality about it going into it? I was fine with it. I had no problem with it. But uh, I, and I'm not, not trying to shift the responsibility or anything at all. Okay, because the bottom line is, no matter what, the number one rule is to take shit and make shoe polish in wrestling. You, no matter what circumstances you are, you're given, you need to make the most of those circumstances and make it work. Um, but you know, we Ray and myself, you know, nobody ever mentions that Ray was, you know, Big Boss Man was in that match as well. Um, you know, uh, and I'm, you know, but we were both a part of it. Um, but we were set up to fail. And the reason we were was because, not intentionally, but the from the very first moment that Vince Russo came to me with this idea, I said, okay, you do understand we have to have highly trained animals, okay? Because listen, even in porn, even in the porn industry, people know you don't work with animals or children. I mean, they're always going to upstage you. So now we're going to build this entire story around the animals. Pay attention, because remember the gimmick, work the gimmick so you can Mm -hmm. tell your story. The gimmick of this match are the animals, are the dogs. So I say, hey, I'll, you know, get me a chihuahua. I'm cool with it. Give me, I need a trained animal. They called a veterinarian clinic, got a list of owners that had the chihuahua, and then they brought the dog to me. That was, that was warning sign one. I keep every single week, and I cannot reiterate, this is not like I'm making this up. I, I swear to God, I swear on my kids' lives, every week at TV. You, you... Al's just frozen. He'll be back with us momentarily. Um, guys, we, we are sitting here. Uh, Al, are you back with us? There you go. Yep, I'm yep. back. So I, I, tell him, I, I tell him again, I, you know, the – we have to have because now I'm I'm scared because they've not brought and I'm like when this need to have dogs that are trained with verbal commands so that then they all have to be from the same kennel with with the same trainers mm-hmm. so that they can command them from the the uh, outside the cell. they can't be inside the cell the, the and when they say a word the dogs go on stop they have to be trained. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We're 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 getting that. We're getting that. I'm like, okay. I said, I, you know, you have to have this. Please understand, because that's that's the gimmick of the match is that one of us is going to get bit. These dogs are supposed to be in that cell yeah. around that cage, like they're sharks. You know, four legged sharks running around. And the jeopardy, the consequence of that match is that one of us is going to get attacked. Okay. So. Um, Week after week, I swear to you, every single TV, both Monday on Raw and Tuesday on SmackDown, I would bring this up every single week. Whenever we filmed anything, we had a conversation about it, I always brought it up. Don't worry, don't worry, worry. 
We get to Charlotte, North Carolina. I walk in and I notice there are nine dogs and there are nine different people standing with these dogs. I immediately put my bags up. I speak to all of the, the people that own these dogs. They're all just owners. One dog had some obedience training. And that was it. Oh, okay. Jesus. They again waited till the day of the show, contacted a veterinarian clinic because I called the office. I called um, you know, and asked what was going on. They called a veterinarian clinic there in Charlotte, got on the list of owners' names who had Rottweilers, and then went and called them and brought them to the arena. So now the owners are out there with the dogs on their leashes. The dogs aren't trained at all. They're not interacting with Ray or I one bit. They're they're literally they're shitting, pissing, and fucking so much so <laughs> that Jesus. they couldn't they could not show them on TV. Yeah. Okay. They couldn't show it. So the so you've spent months. So you understand you've spent months building an entire story around the crux of these dogs. And these dogs aren't trained in any way that where they can be used at all. So what do you expect? You know, quite honestly. Now, again, it is mine and Ray's responsibility. It was our responsibility to take that, take shit and make sure you polish. And yeah. we didn't, you know, we, we, we didn't because to, everybody was watching the dogs, no matter what we did, they were watching the dogs humping each other and shitting everywhere. And, you know, and so you know, it was what it was, but it, it's become this thing of legend because of, you know, Mick and his preoccupation with me, um, you know, where he, you know, he watched made did commentary with Kevin Kelly one time. Um, and now everybody brings it up all the time, which is fine. I don't, you know, I don't care. Um, yeah. but it, it was, you know, um, you know, I, it was a failure on my part because again, uh, you got to take whatever you're given and make the best of it. But um, they, that was a tough hill to climb. I mean, he spent, I forget how many months we spent building that, that matchup, you know, selling that match and like, you know, people envisioning, because what we sold them was this, this, you know, dangerous situation of these animals were going to be loosed in that, that cell, you know, like sharks. And what they got was, you know, shit, piss and, you know, having sex. And that was it. Damn, Jesus! So, so you mentioned, uh, so you mentioned Mick Foley and his uh, always mentioning you. So, Jim Johnson, one of our um, one of our uh, friends here, he wants to. He's made a mention. Mick Foley always tells uh, you know the famous Al Snow stories. Do you Which have? I'm any glad for. I'm grateful for because it keeps my name out there in the public. So you know. <laughs> do, do, do you have any good Mick Foley stories? I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, edit this. I'm gonna edit this question and say, do you have any Mick Foley stories that Mick Foley doesn't want out there? And I don't mean controversial, I've, just funny, random shit. You know. Oh, tons. You know, we <laughs> we started this in the car where it was like a verbal boxing match, and you know we would equate different. Shots like you know, oh, it's a standing eight. Oh, he's against the ropes. Oh, I knocked him out. I, I got to be honest. Verbally, I've knocked Mick out more times than I can count. But I stopped playing it because Mick gets offended easily. He he likes to dish it out, but he can't take it. And he's a friend of mine. You know, it's just you know he gets he he gets his feelings hurt. So I just quit doing it. But he kept on to where it now becomes a preoccupation, you know, to the point where <laughs> anybody that, that is that obsessed, you, you almost think they that it's like they have a sexual proclivity towards you. It's like weird. But um, <laughs> the only thing I can tell you is that Mick back in the day used to tell all of us in the dressing room that, you know, he wanted to be a stand-up comic and we'd all laugh at him, you know. And now he's a stand-up comic and nobody's laughing. So, you know. Yeah. Mick, Mick, Mick has always you been, you been you an you entertaining you guy. You didn't get the joke. Yo, know, you said now he's a stand-up comedian. No, he's laughing. But no, like no, he, he's laughing. But, I, but even when he's he, he being a stand-up, are they? Is it stand-up shows or is it more just you know, like talking shows though? Oh, it's just it's like a spoken word to show. Yeah, and he is a, he is a funny guy. He is he is entertaining. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I also think that the, the, the banter between the back you two back and forth that really showed um when oh. you guys were, were on, on TV, you could definitely tell you guys were, were close friends. And it was almost like seeing oh. like two best friends having the time of their lives in front of a camera, you know. 
Yeah, we had a chemistry. We we still do. Uh, when we get together, we have a chemistry, and and uh, you know, it's it there's it's undeniable. So, you know, we we got to do a lot of. We, we make, gave us a lot of opportunities to do a lot of of, of fun things together. Yeah, no, and and I was a big fan when you guys uh, had your tag run in in, uh, in the WWE. But as I said, we are getting to the hour and twenty mark, so. Before we start wrapping things up with Al, we are going to do the Australian question game. So Al okay. is is aware of this game. So I'm going to say some Australian slang words or Australian uh, saying, and you have to tell me the meaning of the slang word or translate the same. Okay. So okay. first one is, hey, Al, me mate uh, Mick over here, he's a banana bender. What would be a banana bender? Uh, I'm going to say that he likes the he likes he likes the same sex. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we call a banana bender someone from Queensland, Australia. So that's oh, okay, like, yeah, because that's where like they they grow a lot of bananas there. So, all right, all right. Uh, another one is <clears throat> watch out, Al. It's pretty warm here, and my dad looks like he's about to break out the budgie smugglers and go for a swim. What's the budgie uh, smuggler? That'd be like the uh, the uh, the really small swimming trunks that uh, yeah. yeah I, I like to call them yeah the speedo or you know I like to call over here we have a, a big basketball tournament in March we call it the March Madness I call that the March Madness one because it's four weeks of balls. <laughs> All right, so we got another one. Watch out when you leave my house after the barbecue. There's a booze bus just around the corner. What's a booze bus? Uh, like a paddy wagon for the cops. They bust you in for drunk driving. Yeah, it's kind of like that. A booze bus. What they'll do is they'll have like a a thing cornered off on the street, and they'll have like five cops there, just random breath testing yeah. people. So, yeah. all right. I just need to go up to the servo, and then I'm going to go to the bottle o. Then I'll be back for the barbie. What is a servo, bottle o, and barbie? <sighs> Probably you got to go to the restroom, uh, take a piss, then go get some beer, and then come back for the barbecue. Okay, so a servo is a service station, like a gas station. A bottle okay. is a, is a is a a place where you go and buy bottles, like a yeah a liquor store. And beer, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So you got you got you kind of got a little bit of it right. Yeah. So, all right. Now we'll go another one. All right. So. A bush ranger. What is a bush ranger? Uh, probably I'd like over here. We have like forest rangers or park rangers, uh, but or it could be a guy who's uh, trying to pick up, up women at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> a bush ranger is kind of like a highwayman like a patrolman something like that but yeah oh. it could be labeled as someone who's going to a bar we could create a new australian saying all right yeah. so okay so i've got to say this like <laughs> who's a pretty cocky again that could be a that could be hitting on a girl but uh i'm not sure <laughs> It means a cocker too, and I had to whistle like he's a pretty cocky because that's how you, you would say it. But you would say pretty right. cocker too. I don't think anyone in Australia is going to go like, "Hey, cocky, cocky, cocky." Um, <laughs> all right, so we'll go another one. If I say my mouth is dry as a dead dingo's donger in the sun, what does that mean? Uh, it means your 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 mouth is as dry as somebody's dick hanging out in the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about this one, Al? My mate over here is a dead set drongo. Uh, I'd say like a dumbass. Yeah, drongo, dumb shit, whatever you want to call. All right, we'll go to the last one. I'm just going to go outside and suck a durry. I uh, like.
That's it. That's it. Oh, Al, you pretty much have been oh. one of the, the, the high scorers of this. So, you know, I think you'd fit in well in Australia. Um, I Al, love Australia. I, I've you, been there right? numerous times. Yeah, so. Well, Al, so, next, so. Next, next time you're down here after this coronavirus, I'll definitely have to take you out and show you some, uh, some Sydney places. So next time you're out, give me a That'd shout, awesome. man. I would love to. But uh, Al, where, where, can, where can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where can people find you uh, on social media? Well, they can find me at The Real Al Snow on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, there are some fakes out there. That's why I initially I made The Real Al Snow. Um, and if you fake being me, if you make an account and claim you're me, I'm just going to message you and go, look, uh, set the bar higher. You know, if you're going to be fake and being a celebrity, aim higher. Jesus Christ. Have some goals, for God's sakes. Um, <clears throat> you can uh, you can find out more information about OVW at ovwrestling.com. Um, you can also find out about our school, which is the only uh, in the world. We're the only actually state accredited trade school for professional wrestling, sports entertainment, and broadcasting. It's a two year program. And we, uh, we don't just teach the in-ring skills. We teach all the backstage skills of production and management and financial management, uh, writing, uh, uh, all of that uh, in that two-year program. Um, and you can go to aswa.live and you can get more information on the uh, trade school. Um, I tell you here in some of my career, I wrote a book uh, uh, called, you know, uh, self-help, uh, the bizarre experiences in life and times of my career, uh, Val Snow. I just wanted to call it, uh, how to take shit and make shinola and other life lessons I learned from wrestling. But the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh publisher wanted to come up with the self-help book. So self-help title. Uh, and I go into great detail with, and I tell some other stories. I tell Dewey's story. I tell a couple other ridiculous ones as well throughout. And it's not one where I'm bitter and I'm always blaming everybody. I take, I take responsibility. I'm brutally honest about the mistakes I made and, you know, the lessons that I learned from them and, uh, you know, and, and share that perspective. So, you know, um, you know, if they want to watch OVW, um, we just, just recently here on the YTA network uh, here in the United States and America, we're now in 44 million different homes. And uh, if you want to watch internationally, um, we produce a live television show every Tuesday night at eight o'clock Eastern time here in the United States. And we put that up on YouTube um, every single week and uh, you can follow it there as well. Um, you know, we are at nearly 1,100 consecutive episodes. So the only other um, television, you know, production that comes close is uh, WWE's Raw. Um, and we beat SmackDown by a week. That we made our 1,000th episode one week ahead of SmackDown. So, um, you know, we've been doing this for a very long time. And, um, you know, we're getting better and going stronger. And uh, as soon as this uh, COVID quarantine ends we'll be back up and running full bore um like we so that's awesome and i'm definitely going to go and start catching up on some ovw wrestling as, as, as now i can find it but uh guys thank you so much al for coming on and being my guest uh on shooting the shit uncensored it has been a, a great pleasure and it's been a, a a bucket list item for me to talk to to someone that I uh, have, have loved so much over the years watching professional wrestling. Um, guys, I just want to make a special thanks announcement to our sponsors, to uh, Signal Studios for, you know, obviously all the work and support that they do for this show. I want to also thank Mayan Belts, A-Rock Designs, and Immortal Restoning. And I also want to say a special thank you to my good friend, Michael Mados, who makes all the amazing artwork for my show. Uh, I couldn't do it without him, and I really appreciate uh, 
the work that he does to make uh, these the amazing artwork for my show each week. Uh, but till next time, guys, Al, it's been an absolute pleasure. I feel like we hey. could probably do a, do another one with you. But sorry, go yeah, ahead. Can I can I can I too? If uh, if they want, uh, they can join the ovwwrestlingnetwork.com. That's our streaming network where we have all of our content, like a lot of our older content up there as well. That's ovwwrestlingnetwork.com. It's only four ninety nine a month, and um, you can also. I'm part owner of Collar and Elbow. It's a it's a uh, uh, wrestling uh, apparel company. You can go to collarandelbowbrand.com, and if you use the code SNOWMAN, you can take 10% off of your purchase um, there. So we've got cool designs that we try to make that wrestling fans get and understand, and those that aren't wrestling fans just think it's a cool shirt. So you don't have to deal with you know wearing it in public and somebody coming up and going, hey, what do you like wrestling? That's fake. And it's like, well, congratulations, Sherlock Holmes. How long did it take for you to piece all that puzzle together, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely going to go check that out, guys. Please make sure to go check out Collar and Elbow. Check out OVW uh, Wrestling as well. Al, thank you so much for coming on my show. It's been an absolute pleasure. And as I said, a bucket list item for me to talk to uh, one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. Guys, please make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to catch all of our up-to-date content that we're going to be releasing. Um, it, on Sunday night, on Saturday uh, night, 9 p.m. Eastern, uh, this coming week, I USA time, which will be Sunday, 11 a.m. my time. I'm going to be interviewing Samantha Heights, who is the heart of Shimmer Champion. And then on Sunday, 9 p.m. USA Eastern, which will be 11 a.m. Monday, I'm going to be in it, sitting down with former NXT Cruiserweight Champion Leo Rush. So please make sure to tune in for that. Al, again, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, too. I really appreciate it, Piers. No worries. Guys, until next time, we'll catch you soon. Bye.